in the house with Evan Brand. Today, we're going to be talking about the top three nutrients for your lung health to help improve lung inflammation, oxygenation, taking a deep breath, and, and mitigating any of the side effects of any immune stress in our environment. Evan, how are we doing today, man? Doing really well. And I think I covered this briefly. I won't go into the full details because this will be on YouTube and they have certain words that they don't allow. But uh, I will just say that a certain uh, anti-parasitic medication that was very uh, difficult to get uh, got my uncle out of the hospital. And he was the only one to survive. He was in the ICU for three weeks and he was the only one to survive. And my aunt, who's a nurse, gave me the news that, you know, the hospital said that and they were really celebrating his success, even though due to judge's orders, after a few days of his antiparasitic medication, the judges took away his ability to get that medication. And fortunately, he survived. So absolutely incredible. And just goes to show that you really have to be a fighter for your health. You have to be a fighter for your family's health. And so I'm really pumped to be with you today because we're diving into probably some of the most important nutrients that should be in everyone's pantry. And so I think out of the gate, you and I mentioned before we hit record, we want to tie the connection between glutathione and melatonin and NAC. And we've talked about glutathione before. Glutathione is most prevalent in your lungs. And glutathione gets depleted as you age, and it gets depleted when you're exposed to toxins. And so you and I have discussed the use of using a special version of glutathione with sodium bicarbonate that we've put into nebulizers with saline and sometimes mm -hmm. adding silver to that and breathing it in and how it's been an absolute game changer. And then this morning, you were sending me some studies on NAC and there's papers on the management of COPD. So I'll let you take the floor on that. But I think it's incredible because as we're talking, uh, Amazon removed in acetylcysteine from their store about maybe a few months ago. And luckily, you and I use professional manufacturers. So we still have access to this and we do still sell this to the public. Yeah, so exactly. So a couple of benefits of NAC, right? NAC is going to do a few things. It's going to improve glutathione levels. So glutathione is a tripeptide. It's a natural antioxidant, and it's going to help with oxidative stress. So with a lot of infections that are out there in the environment, you, we can see things like hemolysis happen, the breakdown of red blood cells. And when the blood, red blood cells break down, what happens? It's going to release iron, which can create more oxidative stress, more oxidation in the blood vessels, in the vasculature. You can see hypercoagulation. That means the cells start becoming more sticky. When they start becoming more sticky, we have an increased chance of thrombosis and the platelets creating clots essentially. And that's not good. That's gonna affect breathing. That's gonna affect our body's ability to exchange uh, deoxygenated blood uh, with the lungs, get fresh oxygen back to the heart, go back to the left atrium and ventricle out to the body. So it's going to help decrease oxidative stress. It's going to increase uh, blood flow by decreasing the clotting and the coagulation, which is very powerful. There's also um, enzymes in there that are disinfectant type of enzymes like superoxide dismutase. They have an effect on knocking down microbes in the lungs. Also, if you have any secondary and pneumonia issues, guess what? NAC acts as a natural biofilm. So it's going to allow the antimicrobials, right? God forbid you have to go on like a Z pack or any antibiotics. It's going to allow those antibiotics to actually work better because it's going to break down the biofilms, which are like the protective shields. If anyone remembers that movie from 10 plus years ago called 300, right? The movie with the Spartans in there. Remember, they have like a big shield and then they had a spear, right? So they would shield, spear. Think of the shield as what protects, it's the biofilm, right? It's what protects the soldier. You pull out that shield, that soldier is exposed, right? And so that's what we're doing. So it's going to really decrease that biofilm and it's going to make any infections that are in the lungs, especially if it's bacteria, it's going to allow any natural antimicrobials or even if you have to do antibiotics, it's going to allow those to work better. And so it's going to help decrease oxidative stress. It's going to decrease the coagulation, which means cells aren't going to stick. You're not going to have clots. It's going to increase the blood flow. It's going to increase the oxygenation. It's going to help with your natural antimicrobials, your superoxide dismutase and your catalase at the lungs. And it's also going to decrease mucus. It's a mucolytic. And so what that means, any mucus 
from all of the inflammation, that mucus is going to make it very hard for that oxygen exchange to happen. And so it's going to decrease that mucus, it's going to dry out that mucus membrane and allow better exchange between deoxygenated and oxygenated blood, which is very, very powerful. It's kind of, when anytime I look at data, I boil it down to the essence. My brain's always working on the Pareto principle. What's the 20% that's the 80% of the result, right? It's kind of like, 20% of your clothes, you wear 80% of the time, right? If you run a company, 20% of your employees produce 80% of the income, right? The, the Pareto principle. What's the 20% of the information that's going to give me the ability to understand this and, and get an outcome by applying it in my life and health? Yep, yep, well said. Yeah, I'm not telling people to go smoke cigarettes, but this is pretty interesting. In that paper you sent me on the role of N-acetylcysteine and COPD, it talked about how if you were to administer cigarette smoke to the lung, it reduces your total pulmonary glutathione. But yes. if you give N-acetylcysteine at the same time you give cigarette smoke, it prevented the loss of pulmonary glutathione and abolished the effects of cigarette smoke. How interesting is that? So literally, you know, all you smokers out there, hopefully you can get off of that. Maybe you could use some amino acids like yeah. D-alphenylalanine or tyrosine to help with the addiction component. But if you're out there smoking, I think the best thing you could do right now would be to take NAC to protect your lungs from the damage you're doing because you're setting yourself up for further risk of issues. Because if you're depleting your, you know, intra-lung levels of glutathione, you're setting yourself up for more potential oxidative damage and inflammation. 100%. Yep. 100%. Usually with healthy user bias, people that are educated on supplements and taking supplements, they're probably pretty educated on, on the smoking side of the fence and, and aren't doing that. But for sure, right? It's always good to, if we can exchange something or add something in that negates the bad habit, makes it less detrimental, that's always a good thing, right? When we work on the actual um, corrective action for sure. So I like that. Um, so NAC and glutathione are connected. There's some studies on utilizing nebulized glutathione. I, I like that more therapeutically, meaning if there's a more acute issue, someone has a serious lung issue, um, we can get that glutathione into that lungs and increase the levels faster, where if we take NAC, it's going to have more of a systemic increase in glutathione where we're not going to really be able to hit one area more than another. So NAC is wonderful preventative. It's wonderful if you have issues, but if you have acute issues where you're really having a hard time with inflammation in the lung area, doing the nebulized glutathione can be absolutely wonderful because you're going to really improve that level. Uh, the NAC, unlike glutathione, will help with the biofilm. So I would still want to keep the NAC on there because if there are biofilms, let's say some kind of secondary pneumonia, like I mentioned, that's going to help whatever type of antimicrobial you're using to work better. So like that a lot. Very, very good there. Uh, anything else you want to highlight there too? Also, just with like lung issues from allergies, we can see major improvements with just inflammation in the bronchi, um, in the lungs. We can see decreased inflammation in the sinuses as well with using NAC. So it's a really powerful antimicrobial. Forget like an infection, even just things with allergies. So why is that happening? Well, we know things like allergies tend to have this Th2 dominance, right? The part of the immune system that makes antibodies, right? Your IgG, IgM, IgA, et cetera. These are going to be higher, right? You have an overactive Th2 part of the immune system. So we have the cytotoxic branch, which is Th1. That's your natural killer and helper cells, right? This is the first line of defense. We have our Th2, which is the humoral response, the antibodies, right? And so when that's overactive, we can have more allergies and inflammation there. And so glutathione, which NAC does help regulate, is uh, has a major effect on Th3, which is a kind of a modulating part of the immune system that can modulate that seesaw of Th1, Th2. So it can shill out that overactive Th2 response. And they can also dry out the mucous membrane because it is a mucolytic. Now, some patients who have dry nose or those kind of things, you may have to pull back on the NAC. Again, things like good high-quality fats and vitamin A can help help the mucous membrane. So it typically vitamin A is wonderful for mucous membrane support. So if you're doing, you know, pasture-fed eggs, grass-fed meat, cod liver oil, that will help the mucous membrane to be stronger anyway. And you may be able to handle it more. But that's just kind of how that nutrient's working with the immune system, especially if allergies are part of what's driving some of the inflammation in the respiratory tract. 
Yeah, well said. No, the only other thing I would say is you made the distinction between like we're going to use oral glutathione, probably just like on an ongoing basis. You and I manufacture oral versions that are acetylated with NAC. It's a great combo product. But then, like you said, in more acute situations, you could use a nebulized version of it with the sodium bicarbonate. I've played with the sodium bicarbonate version, the, the nebulized version, just to see how it affects sleep quality. And I had a few clients tell me that they sleep like a baby. So I tried it and I can report that I do sleep better if I do that before bed. So maybe some anti-inflammatory mechanism. Don't know exactly what's going on, but I do sleep better with it. So if you're having sleep trouble, you know, something like this nebulized glutathione protocol. And there's actually what we can talk about. Let's move on to melatonin. There are actually <laughs> versions of melatonin that you can inhale and get the melatonin. If you don't, if you don't mind, real quick, I just want to show a couple of these studies on screen. Just so, just so we have it, um, let me just pull, pull this up here. Okay. Okay, so a couple of things here. This was a really good study right here talking about biofilms, right? Talking about NAC is the ability to break down biofilms. And they even talked about the fact that um, in this study, like I mentioned, that NAC in combination with different antibiotics actually improved the permeability um, so it allowed the antibiotics to actually permeate deeper. Now, the benefit of that is if you have a significant illness you, and you need to take antibiotics, you want it to work, right? Now, ideally with the NAC and natural antimicrobials, we're going to ideally not have to get to this level, right? But if you do get to this level and you're taking antibiotics, we want it to work, right? So we talked about NAC and its effect on helping biofilms. And again, this is, um, this is the article right here, U uh, European Review of Medical Pharmacology. And this other study here that we talked about earlier, which is the effects of NAC and, on biofilms and the implication and let me make of one comment. Yeah. So, so let me make one comment on that because, you know, the literature is there. I would bet you exactly zero hospitals and zero ICUs in this country are administering N acetylcysteine while using antibiotics because my uncle was put on antibiotics yeah. with, with no real evidence of any type type of infection or indication that it would even work. It was kind of like a just in case type situation. He wasn't given NAC. I bet you NAC is not even in the hospital in their, their pharmacy to be able to be dispensed. I guess it's possible, but highly unlikely. hundred percent. Just for me right now and my family for just the immune stress in the environment, I'm doing two grams a day or 2000 milligrams a day of, of NAC. I think that's really good to be on. It'll, even 1500, I'd say is probably fine as well. Mm -hmm. And one other thing I wanted to highlight here, which I thought was really important. So we talked about NAC also has antibacterial properties. It helps with the biofilms, right? I think that was really important. Is there anything else I wanted to highlight here? Okay, yeah, so cystic fibrosis. So even genetic conditions that have lung issues, right? It, it helps with the um, breaking down pseudomonas, which is pretty powerful as well, because we if we have dysbiotic bacteria, Klebsiella, right? If these issues become more systemic and move around in the body and go to the lungs, we want to make sure we can knock these things down. Talked about Haemophilus influenza. So really, Ho these are what biofilms look like. Hopefully, people that have been listening to us over the years are just stacking and stacking the information that we're providing. Because as you're talking and as you and I are going through this, it's just amazing because. These are protocols that you and I've been using years before everything that's going on was going on. And now we're seeing that these same protocols that we were using, implementing things like NAC, are actually improving the gut protocols that we're doing with people too. And especially you see all this research on antimicrobial aspects of NAC, antibiofilm aspects of NAC. It's like, wow. So that's why our protocols work so good. It just, it's amazing to see the connection. Yep, absolutely. I wanted to add in one study I saw recently on adding um, arginine into different lung issues. This was an Italian study. I think this was in the Lancet. And they added, I want to say it was 3,500 or 3,200 milligrams of L-arginine in this study. Let me see if I can find the exact amounts. That Pretty sure right. it was 3,200. So 3.2 grams. And what they found was a significant significant reduction in ICU time in these uh, groups that were taking the arginine. This is very powerful. I'll get to the conclusion on this so you guys can see it as we talk. Now, what's the mechanism, right? I, I always want people to get to the meat of the matter. Why is this helping? Now, typically with things like L-arginine, it's almost always happening because of increasing nitric oxide and nitric oxide increasing blood flow. 
right? The problem with a lot of these respiratory cases is if you decrease oxygen saturation, if oxygen levels drop, when oxygen drops, we need oxygen to actually help with the immune system because if we have poor oxygen, we also probably have poor blood flow. If we have poor blood flow, we probably have poor immune flow because the immune cells are in the blood. And then we also use oxygen um, to help knock down infections, right? A lot of these microbes don't like oxygen. So if we decrease oxygen, decrease blood flow, decrease nutrition, these microbes that are that are in these areas driving inflammation are going to continue to do that. So that's a really important component. Also, if we don't have enough good oxygen and blood flow, you know, chance of having clots, it also goes up too, right? Because the more we have inflammation and low blood flow, the more chance that we can have clotting happening, which is then going to obviously cause more problems. That's very Anything cool. else you want to add there, Evan? So it's kind of like a vasodilation effect that's happening from the arginine. That makes perfect sense because you and I've used some pre-workout formulas that'll have arginine and citrulline in there, and we've seen good, good benefits with those two. So yeah, I highly recommend something like that, whether it's like a, you know, we have some professional pre-workout drinks that we use with some arginine citrulline blends, or even just straight arginine would be something else to have in the toolbox. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. And so what they found in this group here is um, finally it should be noted that endothelial dysfunction of T cell impairments are consequences of L arginine. So essentially your T cells need healthy, you need uh, arginine. And so your T cells, that's part of the Th1 branch. You have your helper cells and your natural killer cells. And so these T cells become impaired with low levels of L arginine. So that's really, really important to, to think about there. And um, so where is it? Together, the results of interim analysis indicate L-arginine for standard therapy with patients significantly decrease the length of hospitalization and reduces respiratory uh, support assessed by 10, but not 20 days after the starting treatment. So that's very powerful. I think in this study, there was a 600% reduction in um, time in the ICU. So that's like if you were there two days, and one person was there 12, 12 and a half days, right? That's what that 600% reduction looks like. It's kind of like two to 12, if you will. Do you realize how absolutely insane that is? Headline for that. Why is that not front page news? Why is there not a mandate for everybody to take arginine? That's my question. Where's the mandate for uh, vitamin D levels to be minimum of 60 when we know that 97% uh, of ICU patients have low levels of vitamin D and people with vitamin D levels above 30 are not dying. Where's the mandate for that? There's no money in this. Arginine is so cheap. Vitamin D is so cheap. NAC, glutathione, relatively cheap products. Exactly. And right here, the conclusion is corroborated by the observation that L-arginine supplementation was the main determinant in the reduction in hospital stay duration. So wow. very powerful there. And how yep. many hospitals so, in the U.S. are using arginine? I would tell you yep. zero. If you work yep. in a hospital, if you're a doctor, please contact us. We'll interview you. Let us know what you're doing. But I suspect there are no hospitals doing arginine. Yep. L-arginine, very powerful. Major mechanism is going to be helping. In, in this study right here, just to be clear, the L-arginine group, the findings also confirmed after adjustment for potential confounders such as age. So it wasn't just like, oh, the younger folk were taking it. It was it was across the board, independent of age, which I thought was um, which was really, really important on that on that front. Yeah, absolutely so, incredible. And arginine, that dose is really not even that crazy of a dose. That's kind of your standard dose around three grams is about what you're going to get in some of these, like we're talking about these pre-workout, pre-trained formulas we use from some of these professional manufacturers. They'll use around, give or take two to three grams of arginine. So you're not talking heroic doses. These are very, very attainable doses for your average person to get and to take. 100%. Yep. Absolutely. I like and, it. And I would assume, and I would assume because that's an amino, you would assume that would probably work a little bit better on an empty stomach, but I, I doubt it's going to be a significant problem to take it with food. Yeah. Typically you're going to feel it maybe a little bit more therapeutically because it's going to get absorbed faster. But in the end, it's all going to get absorbed unless you have major gut or bowel issues and significant diarrhea, those kind of things, then maybe empty stomach there. So the food's not affecting the absorption. But if you take it with food, I think it's going to be fine. I don't see a problem with that typically. You may feel Amazing. it a little bit slower, a little more time released. You ready to move on to melatonin? Yeah, I think so. I think that's really good. Um, so right here they talked about um, – I wanted to see one more thing here. Patients were randomized and received study treatments seven, eight days after symptoms. A randomization, all patients were receiving oxygen. So that's good. So they were all getting oxygen. And then right here, placed in the L-arginine, was transferred to intensive care unit before starting the study. Yeah, so we can talk more about this as we go along here. I can come back to this here in a few minutes. I wanted to pull the exact study, the uh, exact amount of time, but I'm pretty sure it was about a um, 
six hundred percent reduction. So it was it was very very significant. Excellent. That, Anything else yeah. you want to say about that, Evan? This is crazy. It's cheap. Everybody should have it on hand. <sighs> Corruption. No, Seven. I get it. Yeah, no, for sure. So let's talk about the next thing here. Um, I think the next thing we wanted to go and talk about was melatonin. So this was uh, melatonin, mitochondria, and cellular energetics. We can hit that one here. Um, let me see here. Melatonin attenuates brain mitochondria, DNA damage. Uh, where's the big one I wanted to highlight here? Where is it? The main mechanism of this big melatonin paper is here just it is. A, Here's the big one. Oh, yeah. The, yeah. So run us through this picture. The main mechanism I'm getting from it, number one, is just incredible potent anti-inflammatory for one thing. Yeah. So when we have lung inflammation, one of the first things that we're going to see is we're going to see increase in inflammation. All right. And we're going to see increase in oxidative stress. So here's one mechanism, oxidative hemolysis. This is the red blood cells breaking down. Lysis means break. Hemo means essentially red blood cell, uh, hematocyte, right? That's your reticulocyte. Those are your red blood cells. So this red blood cell breaks down. That increases oxidative stress. Okay. So things like melatonin, you can see they help modulate these inflammasomes, which are inflammation after the fact. So it's going to modulate the immune system. So it's going to decrease the oxidative stress. It's going to decrease the coagulation, right? So it's an anticoagulant. It's going to prevent the clotting from happening. It's going to prevent the thrombocytopenia. This is blood clots happening, right? Platelets can become clots, essentially. Thrombosis essentially means clots, pulmonary embolism, clots in the lungs, right? It's going to decrease stress on the lung, on the heart, right? Cardiomyocyte hypertrophy, that's the, that's the heart becoming bigger due to the fact that it's having to pump harder due to constriction of blood vessels, due to the uh, platelet aggregation, the clots, and decreased oxygenation is having to pump a lot harder. It, we're modulating the immune system here, right? The CD147, we're modulating the immune response. We're modulating lymphocytes. Look here, GSA, so that's glutathione. So glutathione plays a major role as well. So melatonin can be very, very powerful. In this study, I think we, we saw, what, three milligrams of melatonin being incredibly helpful, right? Yeah, that's right. Say. Go back to that one. Just go to that one that looks old school. It looks like it's on paper. The next tab there. Let's see uh, here. Next to the inhale. There it is. Health. Yep. There it is. So go down, go to page seven, because what this paper is discussing is the fact that melatonin is actually increasing levels of glutathione. There's the image right there. Now, I haven't studied this in detail, but essentially you can read what it's saying at the bottom there. Oh yeah, melatonin is right here. It's it's helping to um, recycle glutathione. So GSH gets recycled to to another form of glutathione. So it's helping with the recycling, and then also and it, it's spitting out what is that that's a hydrogen peroxide two H two O. No H two O is here. So it's converting hydrogen peroxide to oxygen or water, I should say, to water. Look molecule. how it, look at that. It's actually spitting out ATP also. Though. Ah Check yeah, that out. yeah. So the melatonin is actually helping to increase ATP. It's helping. With glutathione recycling, it's converting hydrogen peroxide, which in the lungs can be more inflammatory. So it's converting that to water, which is just normal and, and dealt with in the body easily. And then it's converting ATP. Wow. Yeah, powerful. Yeah, and that makes sense if we go back to this um, image over here, right? We can see glutathione up here, glutathione. So we know melatonin is actually having a role in improving glutathione levels, which is very powerful on the inflammation side of the lungs. Excellent. Yeah. And as you mentioned, the paper they were discussing was about three milligram dosing and three milligrams, I would say is very, very small, especially if it were a very severe sick person. I mean, there would be no reason why we couldn't go 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 milligrams. I mean, three is to me, fairy dusting. Three is like what we'll use for people with just sleep issues. We're not talking ICU people. We're talking, you know, average people who want to sleep better, three milligrams. And that's what these papers are showing massive benefit from. So I think that long story short, a lot of people would technically be underdosing this as well. And you could probably get much, much more higher dosing and more benefits. Yeah, and if you look right here, like I was talking about, melatonin directly scavenges hydrogen peroxide, which is abundantly produced in the mitochondria. From This is basically what's happened with oxidative stress. You have this release of hydrogen peroxide. Um, and so melatonin is improving that, and it's reducing the mitochondrial oxidative damage, which is very very important because we have a lot of inflammation. We have a lot of oxidative damage, and this is part of you know how glutathione and NAC is helping, and melatonin is working off a similar level, which is great. 
Well, what you and I know, and we've discussed this before in some of our sleep podcasts, we know that when you're exposed to toxins like mycotoxins, for example, and when you're older, you, well, so let's, I'll go piece by piece. So mold, mycotoxins that come from mold, that downregulates melatonin production. It affects other hormones too. It affects leptin. It affects many other hormones. And we know that as you age, you make less melatonin. And obviously people that are doing night shift, for example, they're screwing up their circadian rhythm. They're affecting the cortisol melatonin rhythm there. So it would make sense why people that are older are having more severe issues because number one, they've had more time to be exposed to more toxins, therefore depleting their body of glutathione, but they also are likely making less melatonin on their own. And of course, all of the people, I mean, imagine a hundred years ago, if this would have happened when there were less lights, less blue light, less screens, we know that just simply looking at your screens at night is going to shut off melatonin production as well. So to me, it seems like a no brainer to have low dose supplementation ongoing. 100%. Anything else you want to add? I think that's it. Melatonin's awesome. Arginine's awesome. Glutathione's awesome. NAC's awesome. I like it. And so of course, out of the gates here, right? You know, we're talking about arginine, right? We're talking about amino acids. We're talking about NAC, right? What's the hallmark here? A lot of these things, they're just amino acids, right? So make sure you're digesting and eating good, high quality animal protein. That's very important. Make sure you have good digestion. Obviously, when we're talking amino acids, the benefit of taking supplemental amino acids is there's zero transaction fee. We're going to absorb it. 30 to 50% of the energy that goes into to digesting protein is just that it, it's it's withered up in the digestive process because protein can be expensive on your system to digest and so if you don't have great digestion if your sympathetic nervous system's in overdrive if you don't have good stomach acid or enzymes that could be problematic so make sure you're eating good protein make sure you're digesting it maybe you're taking some hcl i recommend try to have some of these supplements in your medicine cabinet ahead of time the biggest thing i found well when in this lancet study they found that um at any point in time these patients were already in the ICU starting these things and mm -hmm. they still got benefit, which is great because you, that means you can take it at any time and still get a benefit. But I find personally, the sooner you get these things on board, I think you would see even, even increased benefit. So if you had these things and you got them on board before you had these major lung inflammations, before they got to a severe level where you were checking into a hospital, I think you're going to do even better. That's just my clinical opinion because it takes time to modulate the immune system. So even though if you wait, you still get a benefit, I think you'll get even bigger benefit later on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Do it earlier. Do yeah, it earlier. You gotta, yeah, you got to get a head start. I mean, there is a possibility of being so far down the rabbit hole that there's no turning back the point of no return that that is totally a, a real thing. So early treatment is definitely important. I just put that link in the chat for you. You know, that was related to that graphic we were looking at. If you just wanted to pull that up briefly, I think it'd be helpful for people. Then we'll wrap it up. And it's just uh, in the journal of medical virology. And it was just talking about melatonin effect on sleep quality and outcomes. And get this, they found that the major thing that improved in the melatonin group was blood oxygen saturation levels. So if you look right there at the last sentence of that first abstract there, uh, oral melatonin could substantially improve sleep quality and blood oxygen saturation. And, you know, the low oxygen saturation is what drives people to be put on mechanical ventilators anyway. So if someone is going off that number and you could simply improve that saturation by simply using something like melatonin, that may save people from going on these things because once you're on those, it's tough to get off of those. Yep, 100%. I think that's, that's very powerful. And again, I think in this group, they didn't see any major difference in, I want to say, in like deaths or going to the ICU, but they did see increase in blood oxygenation. So what does that mean? That just means to me, you shouldn't just rely on melatonin as your only kind of ammo or, you know, uh, arrow in your cap, if you will, right? It shouldn't be the only tool that you have in your toolbox that you use for lung inflammation. I my hypothesis is, well, the problem with studies is they typically have to isolate one variable at a time, right? Now, that's great, but the problem is that's just a really slow way to, to move the needle because what if we're adding in L-arginine and we're also adding in NAC and we're also adding in uh, melatonin and we're also adding in vitamin D? I mean, that's a study that has too many variables. Most researchers would have to really isolate those variables. But we know clinically, there's a lot of studies supporting all these things. So I'd add them all in together. 
if that's me or my family member with issues. So we really want to be on top of it and just know that when we do these things together, we're going to help more of these underlying mechanisms improve blood flow, oxygen, oxidative stress, platelet aggregation, clotting, uh, decreased stress in the heart, right? Uh, overall immune modulation, modulating all the inflammasomes and all the infl inflammatic debris that happens as a result of everything. So that's really important. Yeah, totally synergistic effect. Absolutely. Just like we see with gut and everything else we do clinically. So we'll wrap this thing up. If you need help, please reach out. You can get a hold of Dr. Justin at his website, justinhealth.com, available worldwide for consults via phone, FaceTime, Skype. We'd be happy to put together a protocol for you to help you get your first aid kit, essentially. You know, this kind of kit of good nutrients that you might want to have in your toolbox. Obviously, we could discuss that. We could discuss other issues in regards to sleep and energy and fatigue and, and gut issues and autoimmune issues and skin problems. You know, we work with all of this fertility. So Dr. J at justinhealth.com, me, Evan Brand at evanbrand.com. Once again, available worldwide. We send labs to your door. We can run blood as needed, but a lot of times we're using functional testing, meaning stool and urine, which provide massive amounts of information. And we can look into the brain chemistry. We can look at your amino acids. We can look at glutathione levels mm -hmm. via organic acids. So if someone is listening to this and they're kind of confused and like, well, how do I know I have this problem? Well, we can measure that. So feel free to reach out. We'd love to help you. Absolutely. Evan, great podcast today. Really appreciate the good information, the good back and forth. And again, if you have issues with your lung health, work with your conventional doctor. Try to exhaust all the, the options you have. Again, always try to get to the root underlying issue. And if you have allergies or any underlying issue, the key is you got to modulate the immune system. You got to reduce inflammation. You got to work on helping to improve blood flow. And of course, part of that is going to be a good diet. So if you're just doing a lot of these things that we're talking about and you're not making diet changes, I would say you're not quite getting to the root cause. So try to look a little bit deeper, set the table with a good diet. And if you want to work with someone like Evan mentioned, we're going to really work on setting the table. We're going to look at the hormones, cortisol, and how your gut health also connects there. Because a lot of these nutrients, they have to get absorbed by the gut. And so if we have bottlenecks with our gut absorption, that could be an issue that really affects true healing from occurring. So Evan, great chat today. Really appreciate it, guys. If you enjoyed today's podcast, put comments down below. We'll put a link as well for a review in the notes. We really appreciate a review. It really helps us. It keeps us motivated. Also, increases our view in the podcast rankings so more people can get access to this information. All right, y'all have an awesome day. Good chatting with y'all. Take care now. Evan, take care, man. Bye. All right, bye-bye.